I would say that's the biggest mistake is people thinking, um, I know a lot of students, that, uh, clients I work with, they, they're like, Hey, how, how fast can I get a deal? Like that's kind of, that's kind of the wrong question, right? It's like, they want to, you want to say, Hey, how fast can you take action enough to learn this business? Cause this is a business. It's not like, Hey, you snap your fingers and you, you make $30,000 like as much as people want to seem. Uh, so you have to build up. So I would say that that's the biggest mistake is having the wrong expectations. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, and this is the podcast where we talk about how to raise private money for your real estate deals without even having to ask for money. Well, my guest today has raised so far about $300,000 in private money. And of course that's still growing. And his expertise is this world of wholesaling. So on today's podcast, you're going to learn how to wholesale real estate, what he calls the painless way. That's right. Painless wholesaling is the best way for new wholesalers to get their first deal without wasting tons of money on marketing. Now, back in college, my guest started doing door to door sales and soon became one of the top salesmen in the entire company. Now, after graduating from college, he worked in door to door sales until he decided to get into this world of real estate investing. So now for five years, he's been the co-owner of offer on homes, his real estate investing company and his coaching company titled investor thrive. And that's where he's dedicated to helping wholesalers and real estate investors acquire more real estate, the painless way in just a moment. You're going to meet my good friend uh, and fellow Mastermind member. You're going to meet Nathan Payne right after this. Well, hello, Nathan, and welcome to the show. Hey, what a pleasure. What an honor. Thanks for having me on here. Absolutely. I'm so excited to have you on to talk about how you've gone about raising private money and to talk about your wholesaling business and how it is you go about wholesaling deals and marketing perhaps uh, a, a little bit differently or a whole lot differently than All other right. wholesalers. Uh, I know one thing that you're an expert at is how to get uh, deals under contract, wholesale deals without having to spend a ton of money on marketing. And right. of course, that definitely is uh, very, very attractive to new real estate investors. So, so we're going to talk about private money, but before we do that, I want to go back to your college days. What kind okay. of door to door selling were you doing? And you were like at the top in the company. Dish network. You remember that dish network, uh, selling uh, direct TV, the satellite TV. That's what I did door to door. Wow. Well, I tell you what, <laughs> I say anybody that can do door to door selling and close deals can close any kind of deals out there. Cause I don't know anything harder to do than, than that type of thing. Did they set appointments for you or were you cold door knocking? It's cold door knocking. We would get a specific area down an iPad. You would just uh, go and be like, okay, I'm going to go to this specific area of the neighborhood with Google maps. Right. You would, it would, you would just look over and do that kind of view and you would just farm the area. You, you'd knock you. If someone wasn't there, you'd mark not home. I'll get them later. You just did that all day for like eight hours for like a, a long for you. You would do four about three to four months out of the year. You wouldn't go all year. You would just work in a specific period of time and then you'd be done. So it was like, go all out. And then go take some, take a little break. <laughs> I hear you, man. Well, uh, I would think that those types of characteristics that you have that made you successful in door to door selling, some of those same characteristics are making you super successful in real estate investing, uh, raising private money and wholesaling as well. What would you say were some of your characteristics, personal characteristics that lended themselves to having you be number one in the entire company that now you've transferred over to real estate investing. 
You know what? I would say uh, diligence, determination. I know like when most people start something, they think uh, they're supposed to be good at it, right? But I wasn't amazing at any, really anything I've done in my life when I first started. It was just when I first started, I did okay. I was decent. I at least had the tenacity and the ability to go out and take action. But it was really just I focus and over time I got better. Um, if sales skills improved over time, but it, it was just I was willing to take action and fail forward. Did you have um, a mentor or did you have a coach or did you have someone in the business when you were doing door-to-door -door selling that really helped you out and got you there quicker? Or did you sort of have to navigate that piece on your own? The way that they set you up, they train you for when you first start, they train you for uh, every day. They have what's called correlation. It's usually at like nine o'clock, 10 o'clock where they go over about an hour of training, the role playing, you talk about your numbers, but you get, that's the training you get. And then when it comes to like, when you hit the doors, you get maybe like a day or two of shadowing someone and then they set you loose. So uh, I had people that helped me uh, along the way, but no, nobody that was like, Hey, follow me. This is what, exactly what you do. Let me watch me. It was, it was very little training. I would say, um, when it comes to mentoring, mentoring, there was training, but not kind of what I, what most people would want, right? <laughs> like someone to just follow. And in, in, in other words, uh, you probably would not have, have experienced as much pain as you did when you were out there sort of just thrown to the wolves, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there, there's pros and cons to be thrown to the wolves, but not, unfortunately, not everybody can just get thrown to the wolves and, and want to stick it out. Right. Cause that's what, uh, that's what it requires. Right. Like when you get all that rejection and you lose, you got to really have uh, a desire to keep going or you, you want to quit. But thankfully I just kept going and it, and it worked out. Sure. Um, so let's dive into private money. Yeah. So how is it that private money in your opinion dovetails with wholesaling? So obviously if you wholesale a deal, get a contract or get a, get a property under contract, assign that out for an assignment fee. Uh, you don't need private money for that. So when are you finding that you're using private money in your real estate investing deals? Uh, and you know, and, and how does that correlate with uh, wholesaling? Perfect. Great question. So every deal that I get or every opportunity, I take it through a process where I see what's going to be the biggest return. What's going to make me the most money. And uh, a lot of the time it's taking the deal down and doing a wholesale, which if, for those of you that are listening that don't know what wholesaling is, it's when you just take the house, you buy it, you, uh, you close on it yourself. So whole, wholesaling, you never own the property. You're just selling your, your interest, your right to buy, buy it. You're uh, assigning your contract for a fee, but wholesaling is you close on it, carpet paint, and then you resell it on the MLS. Um, so if that's going to make me more money, I need private money to do so. I'm not going to use my own money. I'm going to go raise it and then be able to get into the deal with zero of my own money. And when it comes to flipping it, so if you want to do a full blown flip, uh, that's not wholetailing because wholetailing is like carpet paint, really basic fix and flip. I would say you need to do a big rehab or a bigger rehab. Uh, you need money for that. So we always take any opportunity we have through that process. It's like a, ca a calculator that I give away for free it. Um, but yeah, th that's why you would need the money. Gotcha. So really when you're looking at a deal, there's uh, the way you analyze deals, there's multiple exit strategies that you can of consider, course. right? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when, when people have one arrow in their quiver, one tool in their toolbox, it's, they're going to pass up on a lot of opportunities to make more money. Um, but that's okay in the beginning. Cause not a lot of people know how to leverage. That's why it's good to network with others that have more experience because they can see more opportunities where more ways to make money than one. But I would say in the beginning, if you don't know how to do all of those things, get with someone that does so you can leverage their uh, knowledge. But yeah. I would say uh, many, many tools <laughs> that we use. Gotcha. Um, it's been my experience in interviewing successful real estate investors, such as yourself here on the podcast. Uh, there's a common thread, not with everybody, but there seems to be a common thread that there was a pivotal moment or something changed. Um, something changed in the market, something changed in their own personal experience that, triggered the real estate investors such as yourself to start raising private money. A lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of people I've interviewed started out and they didn't start out raising private money. That like came along later. So right. what happened, what happened, did, uh, what happened in your story, Nathan? 
That's a great question. I would say when we started looking at leaving money on the table, because uh, wholesaling is not always the most advantageous, uh, I would say the best strategy to use to make the most. It's the quickest and the less, I would say the most convenient and, and less risky, but um, it's not the always, it's not always going to make you the most. So when we, when we started seeing that we we're leaving money on the table, that's when we pivoted. And we also saw that we weren't doing deals, wholesaling deals that we felt like we could have made some money off of. We realized, okay, we're because we're just looking at it from one lens, we're losing out on deals. But if we can take these down with private money, we can uh, capitalize and make more money on these deals. Sure. Um, so when you started raising private money, how did you go about it starting out? Great question. Uh, we, I started reaching out to people like within my circle that I knew of influence, my uh, family members, friends, uh, asking them if they had any money um, that they weren't using or if it was making uh, not enough interest or if they wanted to make more. And then uh, kind of letting them know about the projects that we had that we needed money for. And what we would do is we would use hard money to, for 85% or 90%. And then we would use private for the, um, uh, you know, the rest of the money that you need in order to get inside the, into the deal uh, or, or repairs. So that way we're able to get into these deals with a little, to, well, actually no money. Sure. So you can, so you can actually use private money in a second position or a junior lien position. And it doesn't right. always have to be in first position. So to speak. exactly. Right. 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 So when you first started raising private money, what lessons did you learn and uh, that you might call today a mistake? Like I shouldn't go about raising private money that way. In other words, how do you raise private money today? Maybe differently than when you first started. You know, when I first started trying to raise it, I wasn't very good at explaining the, the, the property itself that we needed to uh, raise money for. But now I make sure that the people feel comfortable. They understand what they're investing in, what the return is and how safe of an investment it is and how they're, you know, backed by the investment itself. So, um, that's probably what I didn't do in the very beginning. I just was like asking people, but not really explaining the uh, specific opportunity. Um, I was like asking for money in general, but now it's more project based. Gotcha. Um, the private money that you're using in today's market, is it for single family houses or is it for other types of real estate as well? Just single family. That's what I focus on and try to stay locked in on that. Right. Same thing for me, Nathan. So let's talk about, um, another expertise of yours and really what you're known for and yeah. that's wholesaling. So, um, what year did you start wholesaling? What year was your first wholesale deal? 2018 is uh, when I first started wholesaling. Okay. So 2018. Yeah. So you, you've been wholesaling since 2018 and you know, a lot of other wholesalers probably, right? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, what, what market do you invest in or markets do you invest in primarily? So primarily in Salt Lake city, Utah, but, uh, I've done nationwide wholesaling all over. I've done deals in several States. I actually live in Canada right now. So I wholesale virtually. Um, so yeah, done them all over, but okay. I would say Salt Lake so, City, uh, Utah. Nationwide, virtually, et cetera. So what would you say are some unique ways that you go about the wholesaling business that is perhaps different from what some other wholesalers do? Uh, I would say it's my approach to work with sellers. It's like the sales process that I use. Uh, it's very transparent and um, open and, and I would say honest because the thing is like a lot of when, when a lot of people start wholesaling, they, they might feel like it's not very uh, like they might be lying to people, right? They might, they might feel like it's not, they're not being very honest with the seller by saying, yes, I'm going to buy it myself. Um, and then they have to go find a buyer. Um, so what the way I approach it is completely different in my sales process, which we can go into. So that's one way. And another way is, uh, my relationships, uh, is, is completely different. Like my relationships with my buyers, uh, is, I think that's one of the greatest ways to sell deals is just by having great relationships. Uh, when I first started, I didn't really have uh, good um, connections or relationships with my buyers. So I would just blast all my deals out and hope someone would respond and want to buy my deal. But now I, I move most of my deals or work with deals directly with buyers that I know. And um, 
So I would say that that's kind of the difference is the sales process and um, how I work with buyers and other wholesalers to uh, help them move their deals as well. What's the best advice or, or piece of advice that you would give, say, to a new real estate investor that wants to start in wholesaling? Where do they start? How do they start? That's a great question. So, you know, it's there's a lot of steps to wholesaling. It's a very simple concept, right? It's like find a discounted property, get it under contract, or find and then find someone that will buy you buy it and pay more than you than you have it for. Uh, but I would say to start, you have to make sure that you're in a market that you understand and you pick one market, like a good market, because a lot of people will they'll spend a lot of time in maybe a market where there's not a lot of flipping going on, not a lot of opportunity. So they'll get stuff and it'll be easy to come by, right? In rural areas, a lot of the time you can find a lot of properties, but it's very difficult to find uh, cash buyers that will buy them for you. So I would say the first place is just make sure you're in the right market. Okay. So, well, how do you, how do you find out if you're in the right market? Like how, how do you research the market? So the way what we have people use is you can use softwares to determine if it's a good market. We like the software Privy, uh, Batch Leads. You can see the invest the investor activity. You can see how many properties have been purchased uh, in that property by cash buyers that have been purchased and then sold uh, within a year, year and a half, and you you can determine that way. That's a that's a good way to do it. So um, we use softwares. That's that would be my answer. Okay. Um... We have actually uh, one of our viewers and listeners that just submitted a question. So I'll read it off to yeah. you. And the question is, uh, how do you use private money in order to scale your wholesale business? Just structure terms with a lender to buy more properties or do you use their money as transactional funding? I would say you could use all all the above to that question. So you can use uh, transactional funding. It's good for double closes. Um, if you do more deals with uh, your private money lenders or hard money lenders, you can negotiate better terms. Uh, I would say that that would be the best way is just do more deals. They trust you with more money or they trust you with the, the money they're giving you continuously. And then you re use it whenever you need the deal. Excellent. Now, one thing that you are known for, Nathan, and that is being able to find motivated sellers, discounted properties, without having to spend an arm and a leg, at least when you're starting out. So right. what are some marketing, um, what are some marketing strategies that you use and that you advise other real estate investors on how to get going? If someone's, you know, on maybe a small or tight budget. So if you're brand new, what I suggest is kind of like what I did when I first started is I, you want to, um, go, like an inch wide and a mile deep, which, which basically means you don't want to pull a giant list and skip trace the whole list and then cold call the whole list of 10,000 absentee owners. You're going to be very busy. It's going to be expensive. What I tell people to do, and actually this is how I coach is I, um, we, we work on specific lists that are highly motivated, uh, pre foreclosures and probates, because in most cities, most areas, the pre foreclosure list is not that big. So it, the problem is getting a hold of those people, right? Cause they're getting reached out to a lot of people by a lot of people. But what we do is we really actively and aggressively reach out to them with the right marketing message to let them know that we're not just there. Hey, do you want, we, do you want to sell your house? Like I'm here to buy your house. We're there to serve and see how we can help them in their situation. Um, so that's what I mean. Like we don't, I wouldn't uh, advise someone to get a big list. Cause that's what I first did. I, I, I got a big list. I sent, uh, spent $10,000 in mail to this big unknown equity list and didn't get a lot of uh, return calls. And I just spent a lot of money and I'm like, no. And I tell people like, no, you don't want to do that because it's very risky. You, you can get the pre foreclosure list, probate list and spend money on skip tracing it. And, uh, you, you're not very deep in the marketing, you're deep in your marketing budget. And if you can't get a hold of these people after reaching out on calls, texts, um, emailing, if you get that in this, uh, through skip tracing, you can go knock their doors. And that's kind of like where my door knocking background comes in. Like that doesn't cost you any money, knock on their door, leave them a flyer, tell them you're there to help. And, uh, you stay consistent and, um, on top of it and your follow up is strong and you'll get a deal. So I was going to ask you, as far as reaching out to these potentially motivated, um, sellers, mm -hmm. uh, are you reaching out to them with just one method or, uh, consistently, or are you reaching out to them, um, consistently with multiple ways, such as either 
direct mail, outbound calling. You mentioned door knocking, right. outbound texting, all those different ways to communicate. Great question. So what I, I advise is you get the list, right? And you start with calling and texting. And that's not like, I don't recommend like an auto dialer because those don't, are, I don't think are very effective. Uh, the, especially when you're calling a lot of people, a lot of those numbers will get flagged as spam. Um, I recommend just get your cell phone or get a Google voice number and just call through the list one by one, call the numbers and determine who, if you can, get, when you can get a hold of the right person. And you might have a couple numbers that return with some, like when you skip trace, John, you might have three or four numbers, but your goal is to get a hold of John, right? So you're going to do that through calling and texting. If you do that through the numbers he has and you can't get a hold of him, call some of his relatives. If they ask him, Hey, I can try to get a hold of John, I'm trying to help him. I think he's in pre foreclosure. I'd like to help. That's how we work with people. Now, if you can't get a hold of him through the calling and texting, that's basically on your phone, doesn't cost you more, more money. You already have a cell phone, go knock the door. Right. If if you knock the door and he doesn't answer, then uh, send them write write a handwritten uh, letter to the the mailing the addresses that came back when you skip traced them. So it's a process of what's the fastest and easiest way to get all of them. It's calling text. Okay, you got to work a little harder. Go knock. Right. It's just it's just a process in order to get a hold of the right person. Sure. What's your opinion on driving for dollars? And I'm thinking most of the people listening to the show know what we mean by driving for dollars. But first of all, tell people what is driving for dollars? What do we mean by that? And then what's your opinion of that as far as, is that a good use of someone's time to find um, potential motivated sellers? Yeah. Uh, so driving for dollars, if none of you know what that means, it just means going around neighborhoods, looking in specific areas where you're marketing, where you're doing your business and looking for homes that look distressed. And what does distressed home mean? That means it looks like it needs paint. It needs uh, like on the outside, maybe there's some broken windows, tall grass, looks like it potentially is vacant. Um, garbage cans are full uh, or they're out on the side of the road and you can notice that they have not been um, taken out or like they've just been there for a long time. It's just, you're looking for any signs of distress to say, Hey, this person might be interested in selling or if, and you say, Hey, they might be interested in selling because they can't keep up with the upkeep of the home. Right? So that's what driving for dollars is. is you're just marking properties, writing it down a list and getting a list of homes that you believe have one of the indicators of the four pillars of motivation, which is the condition is not good. You still have to know if they're motivated, you know, if the price is right uh, and the, why they're selling, but at least, you know, at least one up front that the condition is uh, needs help. Is that, is that decent Jay explaining Absolutely. what driving for dollars is? Sure. So have you done it? Do you advise it? Uh, or does it depend on the individual and how much time they have and et cetera? Great. Great question. So, um, I did driving for dollars a lot when I first got started. What I advise the people that I, my clients that I work with, I say, I wouldn't just hop in the car and start driving around. What I would do is uh, drive for, drive for dollars with purpose. So that means if you've called your pre foreclosure list, if you've uh, texted them, you can't get a hold of them. It's time to you've you've narrowed it down to I haven't been able to get hold of twenty people. Go knock on those doors while you're going to drive to those pre people's homes. Then if you notice anything, drive for dollars. You're because you're intentionally going to a specific home, or if you're going to an appointment intentionally get there 15 minutes early and drive around the property. Uh, but I wouldn't just set aside eight hours to drive all day because I think there's a better way of going about it. So do it, but do it intentionally. Well, I love your advice on that point because it's, they're already that they're already going, as you say, to a specific property, right? So you're going to be making that trip anyway. What you're doing is you're leveraging that time, as you say, by getting there 15, 20 minutes earlier. Take a, take a look at what's around. And you know what I love about that advice? I do not know why it is. I, I don't see if, see if you, um, if this has happened to you as well, Nathan, yeah. but I have not intentionally tried to buy five houses within a half a mile of each other, but I have, mm -hmm. yeah. I have, it's like, right. it's like, why am I buying all these houses that are right around each other? I mean, the neighborhood itself was not distressed, but mm -hmm. for some reason, I mean, I don't know if it was something in the water that those people were drinking. I don't know, but mm -hmm. it seems that I have bought houses in pockets, you know, like together. Have you run into that? 
Yeah, that seems to be uh, happens quite a bit in Salt Lake City. We we tend to do more deals in specific areas of the town ta- uh, of like the suburbs of Salt Lake. Um, I don't know why that is either. Maybe that I don't know. I don't. I don't have an answer. <laughs> hey, I understand I what you're it. saying though. If I had the answer to that, then I'd know where to go market and then just, and then just you know, uh, canvas that whole area right there. You, you, you know what I think it might be? This is just a thought. I think that sometimes when those people in those areas in those pockets see a flipper that is going in and fixing up a property, maybe they in the back of their head like, hmm, you know, that might be something I'm open to. Maybe I might be open to selling my property and having someone take over. Yep, could be, could be. Now, Nathan, you have coached. Um, a lot of clients, a lot of real estate investors, um, showing them how to do wholesaling the quote unquote painless way. That's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> and so since you've got so much experience in working with other real estate investors and coaching them on wholesaling and et cetera, what common threads have you seen as far as mistakes that new wholesalers make? Or and that you may warn them against, or you actually see them still doing it. You know, this this is a common theme that just keeps on coming back to my mind all the time. Is I think a lot of people don't think this business, they don't think it works, or they 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 just don't think it works for them. And, and it's because they haven't taken the action that's required to see the results they need. Um, that's what I just keep seeing. I think the problem is people they say they judge too quickly if this is for them or not, but without getting, putting in enough work to see the results. Does that make sense? So like if they'll call like 10, 20 people and then they don't get a deal, they're like, Oh, this doesn't work. And it's, I relate it. Let's relate it to door to door. I go knock 20 doors and I don't get a uh, sell a dish account. And I can say, Oh, this doesn't work. Well, no, it's, you haven't knocked enough doors. You're not good enough to knock 20 doors and close one. Maybe in the future you will, because you're good, you'll get better. And so I would say that's the biggest mistake is people thinking, um, I know a lot of students, that, uh, clients I work with, they, they're like, Hey, how, how fast can I get a deal? Like that's kind of, that's kind of the wrong question, right? It's like, they want to, you want to say, Hey, how fast can you take action enough to learn this business? Cause this is a business. It's not like, Hey, you snap your fingers and you, you make $30,000, like as much as people want to seem. Uh, so you have to build up. So I would say that that's the biggest mistake is having the wrong expectations. I would think one common question that you get from your coaching clients is really how much time do I need in order to be successful at this? They, they probably, mm-hmm. everyone I'm asking you that before they enroll with you to work together. And of what course. is your, what is your answer to that? It all depends on the experience that you bring before, right? Cause I came into wholesaling uh, with six years of door to door sales experience. And I still was not good at talking to people when it came to this sales process It's completely different. So it depends their business experience, their diligence, like how, how diligent they're going to be with staying consistent with their, uh, process. But I would say if you're diligent and you keep, you hit these KPIs, if you work, if you call 40 people a day, if you get a hold of 15, you stay consistent, you're going to get a deal within 90 days. The problem is if they don't see those results, it's, well, it's, we probably haven't been that consistent. So 90 days is my answer. If you're consistent with the actions you need to take. Perfect. Well, the name of your wholesaling coaching company is Investor Thrive. Um, tell the audience about Investor Thrive and um, what that process sort of looks like. And then, of course, how can they go apply to um, perhaps work with you? And I think you mentioned a free calculator somewhere you got. Yeah, yeah. So in my Facebook group, uh, Painless uh, Flipping, it's a Painless Flipping group. Uh, it, what it's called, you can type that in if you guys see the link below, but it's just Painless Flipping free Facebook group. But if you join and you add your email where we send you a free gift, we'll send you the exact calculator that I use to analyze my deals on whether I should wholesale, fix and flip, wholesale, burr, you name it. We just take it through all the process, uh, all the process we have. But um, that's that's the calculator. And sorry, right. Jay, what, what was, the, what was after that? Out. Yeah, I was going to say, hold up right there. I want everybody to know that how you spell your name yeah. <laughs> for those that are listening sure. on the audio podcast. So that's painless, which is P A Y N E L E S S, painless, P A Y N E L, I can't even talk, P A Y N E for painless, L E S S. Say the name of that Facebook group again for the easy way for them to find it. 
painless flipping, just type in painless flipping, like my last name, Payne, P A Y N E, Nathan Payne, painless flipping free Facebook group. You type that in, you're going to find it. And then when you join, just throw your email in when we ask the first question, hey, what's your email so we can send you a free gift? That's the gift you'll get. Awesome. Now, uh, tell everybody a little bit about your free Facebook group and how that works. Yeah. So I created the free Facebook group because uh, a lot of people don't know where to start, right? So the free Facebook group, it's not just another one of those. I think there might be like 10, like a hundred million Facebook groups on Facebook. So everybody knows it's a part of probably a ton of Facebook groups. So what this one is, it's, uh, it's a free course. So when you get in there, we get you the calculator for free, but there's a free course in the guide section where you can go through and you can see my exact painless flipping process of how I do deals with agents and then you can relay the relate the sales process that I do and the way of finding deals to really any strategy. Uh, but it's just a free course that I've spent a lot of time on. I used to charge for the course. I used to charge, it was $10,000 for the mentorship, but I put the course in there for free because now we offer something a lot more in depth. Uh, so now we're giving away uh, that course for free in there. So that's, that's the free Facebook group. And I can kind of explain Jay, if you'd like what my process is and why and how my program, um, I would call it, it's not, I don't like to call it a program. I call it an apprenticeship. That's what I offer. I can kind of explain how we work with people now. Sure. Go ahead. So, uh, painless flipping, what painless flipping is, it's, it's a process of, uh, leveraging buyers to make offers for you versus you with most wholesalers. They don't really know what to offer. It's a kind of a problem. It's a big problem, right? That they'll be talking to a seller and the seller will want, retailer close normally, right? Unless they lowball themselves and then you, you're already in the money, but that usually doesn't happen. So most sellers want, they look at Zillow and they say they, they want Zillow. So we have relationships with buyers uh, that we work with, and this is called painless flipping. It's working the painless way where you connect with buyers. And if you have a seller that's motivated, instead of just making a low offer and hoping it's low enough and not having to come back and renegotiate later, which a lot of people do, they cancel contracts. We just tell the seller like, Hey, uh, this is where I would need to be for me to buy it. You give them the offer where it's a no brainer for you to work with. Usually they, they say no. Then you say, okay, no problem. If that doesn't work for you, I know a couple buyers that I work with that might be able to pay more than me. Do you mind if I just check with them and see if that's something, um, maybe they may be able uh, to pay you a little bit more than I could. And then you just go leverage, you, you leverage your buyers, see where they would be. You don't have to get under, you can get under contract if you want to. You don't have to, uh, since you have those relationships with your buyers. And then you can leverage their offers to uh, get the deal done. And usually, um, since you have all those different offers that are coming from your buyers, you can go back to the seller and say, hey, I know you didn't accept my offer at seven, 700,000, right? I got a couple, most of the couple buyers I use, they're, they're around 720, 730. And I know you wanted 800,000, but this is what the market's saying. Like, this is what people are saying. So, um, you know, we could potentially get you 720 if that would work. So you're basically leveraging your buyers uh, the painless way, way I would say, instead of saying, yes, I can pay this. And then going back and forth or having to cancel contracts, you're just leveraging your relationships in order to uh, do it without all the back and forth. And I would say uh, lying, right? Because if you don't know, don't just throw out a number. And I, I think that's why wholesaling gets a bad rap. A lot of people are new. They just throw out a number, get people under contract, they cancel. And I just think there's a better way to do it. I love it. I love the process and I love it because you're starting from a position of, I mean, in your conversations with sellers of here, I'm here to serve you. And uh, I want to see if I, I want to see if I can help out kind of thing. Exactly. That's yeah. wonderful. Nathan, I love the approach. I love your heart, man. I can't wait to see you at our upcoming mastermind meeting. And there you have it, my friends, be sure and check out, take advantage of Nathan's a uh, free gift that he's offering there on the, um, on the calculator. You got painlessflipping.com. Go to Facebook group and uh, search in Facebook groups for painless flipping. Nathan, God bless you. Thank you so much for joining me today on the show. I appreciate you having me. And if anybody wants to chat, I'd love to chat. Uh, not, not any, no strings attached. I just love to help and see how I can help you in your journey. So go to painlessflipping.com and book a call. If you just want to see how our process might be able to help you. We don't do, programs like uh in the sense of like hey jump in and work with us uh and you're gonna have a hundred people on a one call we actually do a pr apprenticeship model where you can we work with you directly 
and we help you through your deals, right? So we'll help you get them under contract. We'll uh, tell you what to offer. You can partner with us if you want, or we'll just tell you what to do. So it's a lot more hands-on. That's what we've noticed that people need. So that's what we're doing over at the painless flipping. We're, we're making it painless for people that want to learn as well. I love it. That's www.painlessflipping.com. P A Y N E, just like Nathan's last name. P A Y N E, lessflipping.com. Painlessflipping.com. Thank you so much, Nathan. Talk to you soon. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. I appreciate you being here with me, and I really, really appreciate. Uh, you are subscribing, rating, and reviewing. That feedback really helps us out. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure and click that bell so you don't miss out on any of the upcoming amazing episodes. And I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.